Hello and welcome to our Monday Thursday worship. I'm Pastor Paul Dickerson and it is good to be here and worship with you together this way. On the final night before Jesus' death, he gathered his disciples for one last meal. In just a few hours, he would be betrayed, arrested, and tried. In just a few hours, he would give up his life to secure the salvation of the entire world. We worship together for this Monday Thursday. Uh, I invite you to take just a moment to prepare for worship. Uh, if you have a candle and some fire, you might want to go get those. Uh, if you have a Bible and you want to follow along with the scripture readings, we're going to be in Mark chapter 14, so you can gather that. Uh, anyone else in the home with you uh, and prepare for worship. We begin our worship by remembering the God who places his name on us. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, I invite you to read with me responsibly uh, the same words we've been using throughout our midweek services. Uh, we read the words of Scripture responsibly. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Jesus said, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised. For our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sin on the cross. May our hearts be so fixed in steadfast faith in him that we too might die to our sins and rise to new life in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed. The meal, Mark 14, verses 12 through 25. 
And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. As they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes it is as, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and after they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. One of the things I've missed most in the last 12 months is simply sitting down and sharing a meal with my friends and my family, uh, with new acquaintances and, and even with complete strangers. I've missed uh, those big celebrations like holidays, Christmas and Thanksgiving, uh, birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, uh, being able to sit down and celebrate together as a group. But even more than that, I've missed the small gatherings, uh, showing up at a friend's house uh, for dinner or having an impromptu barbecue with friends. And, and even when my family and I, when we have been able to gather together with those kind of outside of our pod, there have been so many rules about uh, masks or not, about passing the food and, and all sorts of other things that it just hasn't been the same. And so I am looking forward to that day when I can sit down with my family and friends uh, without the burdens, without the distractions, without all of the challenges that we've had this last year. I can't wait. Of course, it's not just the food. Uh, part of sitting down and sharing a meal with someone, it, it reflects a certain level of intimacy that you have with those around the table. Uh, you know, at work we might have meetings or appointments, uh, we might go out to lunch with colleagues, but so much of that is just about getting things done. Uh, it's transactional, it's trying to be efficient with our time. But it's completely different when you're in someone's home or celebrating a holiday together. Uh, when you invite someone over to share Thanksgiving dinner with you, or when they invite you to have dinner at their house. It's not just about the food on the table, it's about who you're sharing that meal with. It's about the relationship, the intimacy that you share. Mark tells us that on the final night, before he went to the cross, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. And not just any meal, but the Passover meal. Uh, the Passover was usually a meal shared amongst family members, but here, Jesus is sharing the meal with his disciples, with his closest friends, and once again, he's redefining what it means to be a family. And Jesus himself is at the center of it all. But at some point during the meal, Jesus goes off script. Uh, he's no longer simply the host of a Passover, uh, rehearsing the lines and, and reenacting the Exodus. But instead, he takes bread and he takes the cup. And he announces a new covenant between God and his people, a new type of relationship, not one that's based on laws or animal sacrifice, but instead one that's sealed with his very own blood. Jesus gives a preview of what's about to happen on the cross as his body will be broken, as his blood will be poured out, not just for the people around the table, but for the entire world to restore an intimate relationship between humanity and their God. And then after instituting this new relationship between man and God, uh, Jesus makes this curious statement. He says, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God would seem that Jesus is also waiting. 
Uh, he's waiting once again to share a meal with his closest friends, uh, with those he has redeemed by his own blood. Jesus is waiting to feast and to drink with you. I invite you to pause uh, worship for just a moment uh, and consider these two questions. Uh, first, describe the best meal that you have ever shared with somebody and what it was that made that meal so special. And then second, consider how you feel knowing that Jesus is waiting to share a meal with you. Uh, I invite you to consider those questions either on your own or with the people you're with. And when you're ready, we'll resume worship. Mark 14, 26 to 42. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. As Jesus and his disciples reach the Mount of Olives, it's no longer just one of the twelve who will betray Jesus. Jesus says they will all fall away. But the thing is, the disciples aren't having any of it. They reject what Jesus has to say, and just like that, uh, the relationship, the intimacy, the, the fellowship that they enjoyed around the table is broken. And the disciples set themselves against Jesus and what he has to say to them. But what about you? What about me? And what words has Jesus spoken that are hard for us to accept and live by? What words do we react against or maybe even outright reject? Uh, Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all, but, but we want to be free to call our own shots, to pick and choose when and who we will serve. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. But how often have we shrunk back in fear and in shame when presented with an opportunity to tell someone else about Jesus? Jesus said, whoever looks at a woman lustfully commits adultery, 
Whoever is angry with his brother or sister is subject to the same judgment as a murderer. And yet we treat these sins as commonplace, as normal. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. But we often prefer a comfortable, painless type of discipleship that, that doesn't require too much of us. Like the disciples, we prefer to follow Jesus on our own terms and not his. And we reject what Jesus has to say to us. Perhaps other examples are coming to your mind. Uh, other words that, of Jesus that you have resisted or rejected. One way to think about sin is that at its heart, sin is a denial of what God has to say to us. It's a desire for our own desires over and against him and his word. And so in this way, we have all sinned. We have turned from faithfulness and the obedience that God has called us to. Like the disciples, we've broken faith and we've fallen away. But Jesus, Jesus is faithful. As the disciples reject Jesus, betray him, flee from him, only Jesus remains steadfast and immovable. Only Jesus stays the course and does not turn. Even, even when he asks his father if it's possible to deviate from the plan, he still prays, yet not as I will, but what you will. Only Jesus is faithful. You see, in Jesus, we have so much more than simply an example of how to live or how to pray or how to be faithful when times are challenging and hard. In Jesus, you have a Savior who is strong when you are weak, uh, who stands firm when you flee, who is faithful even when it seems like the entire world is crashing down on you. In the end, Jesus stands alone, ready and willing to do what no one else can, what we can't hope to do for ourselves. Only Jesus is faithful to death, and only Jesus is able to go to the cross. Once again, uh, I invite you to pause, uh, worship, and consider these two questions, either by yourself or with those around you. First, what words of Jesus do you find hard to accept? And then second, think of at least one way Jesus has been faithful to you this year. I invite you to consider those questions, and when you're done, we'll resume worship. Rest. Mark 14, 42 through 50. And immediately, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, a sign of friendship, affection, even love. It's ironic that the Son of God, the God who is love, is betrayed by this symbol of love. But notice the very last sentence, and they all left him and fled. Like Judas, like Peter, like all of Jesus' disciples, we betray, we deny, we flee from him. 
along with the first disciples, you and I are fellow sinners. And so we voice the words of the thief on the cross as we seek God's forgiveness for our sin and our failings. I invite you to speak these words of confession with me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Do not remember my rebellious ways, my faithless ways, my selfish ways. According to your love and mercy, remember me and cleanse me from my sin. Take a moment of silence for individual confession. Years after Jesus rose from the dead, uh, John, one of Jesus' closest friends and one of the disciples who fled from him that night, wrote this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Almighty God has heard your confession, and in his mercy, he has given his Son to die for you. Uh, for the sake of Jesus, God forgives you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together for a time of prayer. Uh, in the garden, Jesus invited his disciples to watch and pray with him. Uh, and so as you decide how to pray, uh, if you're with others, you can have one person pray for the entire group, uh, or you could go around and have each person offer a petition ending with amen. Uh, if you're by yourself, uh, you could pray out loud, uh, even though it's just you, uh, as a way to add focus to your prayers. Uh, or you could even write your prayers down. If you're not sure about what to pray, consider someone you know who is suffering tonight. Uh, or maybe someone you know who is far from Jesus. Or simply thank God for Jesus, uh, for his cross and the empty tomb. When you're finished, hit play, and we'll continue with the Lord's Prayer together. We pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of Almighty God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
life's great shadows flee.